you know, I, I say this often just so you understand how privileged we are. When the Bible was originally put out as in its entirety, Old and New Testament, there were no chapters and verses. Just long books. It's like um, weren't even chapters. You know, you know, you get a. If, I never read it, but you know that big long book, War and Peace. I don't know how many chapters they uh, have, but I'm assuming every chapter is very long. Which means once you get into chapter 3, there's no breaks of chapter 4. And uh, so you have to fold pages over when you can't read it all the way, mark it up so you know where to start the next day or whatever. Well, that's kind of how the the Bible was initially, except it uh, didn't even have chapters. So um, in the 1300s and the 1400s, Translators, I forget which, uh, I, well, it had to be chapters first. One century they added chapters, they began to divide by chapters. And a century, sometime during the next century, they started, uh, trans, or people translating the Bible uh, started adding verses. So now we have the privilege of being able to turn exactly where we want to in a Bible by going to chapter and verse. I say all that because what's written is the inspired Word of God. The chapters and the verses aren't. Where the chapters go, where, where the chapter breaks go, where the verses are. It's just what someone thought, uh, the translator thought, well, this sounds like a good break here. Sometimes commentators say, no, they shouldn't have broke it there. They shouldn't have changed chapters there. Um... Some of the modern translations have one of the verses a little longer with the next verse shorter because they thought part of that verse belonged with the other one. And um, But the bottom line is they sure got the end of uh, the, the right division for the end of chapter 12 and the beginning of chapter 13 of Hebrews. I mean, it's a clean break from uh, what we talked about Sunday morning and uh, are going to do a little bit of it in review to um, what we're going to have uh, starting uh, in this evening, starting the 13th and final chapter. Um, last week, the lesson was the shaken and the unshakable. Or I'm used to saying last week, but we're doing Hebrews now both uh, Sunday and Tuesday. So rather t- or Sunday... Um, we did that message, the majority of it, we didn't finish some of it, so I included some of those notes in the review. The shaken and the unshakable. And when he's done with that, chapter 13 completely starts a new thought. And so it's a clean chapter break. And um, again, the, where the verses are separated, where the chapters, that's people's guesses. Uh, the main thing is they didn't mess with the words because the words are inspired. But they made it easier. Don't you think it's easier? Suppose this was just one book with no chapters and verses. And I told you, I'm going to be about right here. And you tried to find it to follow along with me. That would be a little difficult. So thank God the Almighty we have it divided this way. Uh, of course, in Paul's days, most people did not have a whole Bible. And a, um, Paul addressed epistles to certain uh, groups of people. And then somebody in that group would copy it and take it to a nearby church. So most of the churches then didn't have the whole New Testament even, the beginning of the church age. So you'd have Paul and the other apostles traveling around teaching. And I'm assuming uh, a lot of it was written down by uh, people who uh, not everybody, of course, could read and write uh, in earlier parts of history. But uh, there was always some very literate people. And I'm sure they tried to copy down a lot of the sermons and such so they could um, share them in the church when the preacher was gone and try to uh, get a clear understanding of what the preacher was saying. So it'd be hard when the Apostle Paul, that is the epitome 
of the preacher of Bible truth. Uh, I mean, this guy wrote so much of what the New Testament church stands on. But when he went someplace, he preached. And sometimes, I don't know how often a week he would preach, but then sometimes he'd stay there a year, sometimes two years, and then he'd leave town. He'd uh, try to train someone up to know enough of what he was trying to teach to become the pastor. And then he'd move on to a new town. And uh, but you can imagine... Think of all the times you've heard me preach and try to picture how much you could share with somebody else exactly what I preached. Because it's not written down. You couldn't go back and study it. Now you can now because Jason puts them on YouTube. But um, um, but nonetheless, most, uh, most people... If they hear you once, they don't want to hear the same sermon again. So, um, But that's the way it was in the first century church. And so Paul would establish like the Galatians and saw a doctrine and leave town and false teachers would come in and mess them all up. And Paul said, wow, what happened to you? How could you so quickly be removed from the truth? Well... Being flesh and blood, I can understand if you just had them there a while and left town and didn't have any of the sermons you could refer back to, uh, didn't have the epistle yet. Paul didn't, uh, but when Paul left, he hadn't even had an epistle for him yet that they could check on. So we live in a blessed time. There's really no excuse for us not to uh, start getting an understanding of Scripture in this generation. But last week, and I forgot, I recognized it, and I was going to go back and didn't do it. Last week we uh, did verses 25 to 29 of chapter 12. I forgot to put, and I'm, uh, I skipped the first uh, one. I didn't want a real long review and just have verses 26 to 29, but I forgot to put chapter 12 in front of that. So, in our last, we didn't quite get it all covered, so we're going to call it review. Verse 26, he said, Whose voice, talking about God, then shook the earth? But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. In this word, now the author of Hebrews, writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants his readers to understand something. When Haggai is where he is uh, uh, quoting from, the author of Hebrews is quoting by the Old Testament from the Old Testament prophet Haggai, and he does, gives commentary here in verse twenty-seven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So he gave commentary and said, here's why this great shaking is coming. We're going to be stepping into eternity at some point, not just the people that die and go on ahead of us, but all the followers of Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. We're going to step out of the temporary into the eternal. And... Um, those are things we need to understand. And so John, and that's why in, um, Paul wrote in First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians chapter uh, 5 going into chapter 6 that we need to be focused on the eternal, not the temporary. Because the eternal remains, the temporary passes away. Most of our focus, because we're living, breathing human beings who like to eat and sleep and laugh and have fun, and we get all, most of our vis vis visualization. That's a fun word. I made it a little more complicated than it needed to be. Since I tried it again, visualization. Um, we think we watch TV. We watch. Sports, we watch comedies, we watch movies on TV, we watch stuff, and we love it. 
all that stuff is going to pass away. It isn't doing anything for our eternal welfare whatsoever. It's just something we enjoy in this life. Paul said that, Paul's not saying you shouldn't enjoy life. But what he's saying is always remember what's more important. The eternal is more important. The eternal is so much more important. Even if you're facing death, don't let that consume you. Because life is what's eternal. Death is temporary. Life is eternal. It won't remain as we understand life. It'll become a different life, an eternal life. But life itself is eternal. So uh, we are encouraged. um, Don't look at just what uh, you see around here. And 2 Peter there, 3.12, Looking for and hasting on to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall mount with fervent heat. By the way, the earth is part of the heavens. This isn't talking about heaven where God lives. This is talking about space, universe. So he is saying the elements are going to be on fire and they're going to be dissolved. Uh... The men shall mount with fervent heat. So, I put a note there. I believe this shaking will happen when we are all gathered at the great white throne judgment. Christians will be there witnessing the proceedings. Unbelievers will be there facing the judgment of God. I don't believe the great white throne judgment that you read about in, in um, Revelation 20 is for the Christian. Earlier in the New Testament, it tells us that the the Christians will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. What's the difference between the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ? The judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. And we will be judged and rewarded for those things that meet the test. And those things, we might have done something good, I mentioned last week, but we did it for a bad reason. There won't be any reward for that. Jesus talked about how Pharisees would wait till there was a crowd gathered. Then they'd step outside and they'd pray loud prayers where everybody could hear how great they prayed. And Jesus, and, and they would give offerings to the poor when they had an audience. And Jesus said, when you do those things, you seek the reward of attention. So when you get the attention, that's the only reward you're, that you got coming to you for that. If somebody puts a thousand dollar check in the church offering, like Art's going to do this Sunday, uh, if somebody put, going to put a thousand dollar check in the church offering, but wants to wait till everybody's watching, that's the only reward. Their attention is the only reward you're going to get for that. So the judgment seat of Christ simply looks at all we have done and determines which good things we've done for the for the right reasons, and we will be rewarded for those things. The other works that we have done will be burned up. It doesn't determine whether or not we'll go to heaven. The judgment seat of Christ is for Christians. We're going to heaven. It's simply a judgment seat where our works are uh, judged to see which ones will, we will be rewarded for. And um, But the great white throne judgment, hell and death gives up all their dead. There's a lake of fire over here where everybody whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life is thrown. This is a judgment in a sense of everybody, but not really. The Christians have already been judged. When you stand before God at the great white throne judgment and you tell him, well, I did this, God, and I did this, God, God's going to get out two books, the book of Revelation tells us. One is the book of works. He's going to look up, and he's a speed reader. He's going to look up your name, and it's going to be the right you with that name, not somebody else. He'll never make a mistake. 
And he's going to say, all right, here's George Wilson. And he's going to see everything he did. He's going to see every sin he committed. And once he sees sins recorded, the individual only has one hope. So he takes out the other book, the Lamb's Book of Life. If your if your record book has sins recorded, and your name's not in the Lamb's Book of Life, guess what? You ain't going to heaven. Those two books are what are utilized. Now, God already knows everything. But He does all this to show justice. He's not picking and choosing. He is looking at people who have earned hell. Now, we have earned hell, but Jesus faced the wrath of God on our behalf. So, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, our sins have been forgiven never to be remembered against us anymore. Not that God is senile and can't remember what I did. He lives everywhere in time. He sees what I did over and over again. But the point is, He doesn't remember it against me. Why? Because the blood of Christ washed it away. Cleansed me of the guilt of that sin. So, in my mind, and I think I have it right, if God, at the judgment seat of Christ, I don't think that's a step, but we don't read about that step taking place, where you um, look at the book of records. But I, I believe if... Well, let's just pick a fictio, uh, fictitious name. Bob Gerstentine. He's a Christian and he dies, but he is very mischievous and he wants to know what I really did in my life. So when he gets to heaven, he looks for the hall of records. And he figures out the system, how to find the exact Dave Hanna that I am. So he gets in there and sneaks when God isn't looking. Because you know God, he can get careless sometime and not look. And he finds the right area, the right David Hanna, and he said, oh, I got the book, I got the book. And he opens it up. I firmly believe this is what he will find recorded in the records of, uh, of, in heaven for me. Righteous. He took the blame for my sin and gave me the credit for his obedience. There will be no records in heaven showing the wrong I've done. But in spite of all my mistakes, what Jesus is going to say to me? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So those are judgments going on up there in heaven. Now, Verse 28, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, the eternal kingdom, heaven, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So what's he in essence saying? We shouldn't cheapen grace by bad conduct. We shouldn't cheapen grace by bad conduct. Well, my sins are forgiven. I might as well party. Verse 29, why not? For God is a consuming fire. Now, He will judge many of the very people we love. I want you to catch this. He's going to judge many unsaved people that we love in this world right now. We as Christians should live godly lives. How come God's a consuming fire? We should understand that because He's going to judge unsaved people that we love, we must live godly lives in front of them, hoping to establish a foundation of trust with them that we're not phonies, so that at the right time we can share the gospel with them. 
If we turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, we cheapen the grace of God, why would they listen to us? They think, you're no different than I am. So it's imperative that we as believers understand, yeah, our sins are forgiven, but now we must live right for the sake of those watching us. Now, we're going to go into the chapter break now and uh, go to chapter 13. I've entitled the lesson, Loving Believers. I regretted that a little bit after I printed it out. I wish I'd have used another phrase in these verses. Entertaining angels unaware. I wish I'd have made that the title. Entertaining angels unaware. Um, you can cross that out and change the name if you want. Uh, I might do it when I get home on the computer. Entertaining because it's going to talk about angels. And um, how sometimes they're around us and we don't have a clue. So, in one sense, this is a queen break from this Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But then again, there's the unshakable. From that, now, listen to what the next, the first verse says. Uh, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Remember, the New Testament is written in Greek. Those four words come from two Greek words. Verse 1 of chapter ter- 13 has two words in it in the Greek. If you had a computer program that is, uh, well, for example, ESOR, one of the, um, they have two King James translations. Well, more than that, they have modern King James. But I mean, of the Bible you have in your hand, if you have an old King James Bible in your hand, They've got it down twice. Once the way you read it. The second time with Greek numbers after the words telling you what... So when you click on that Greek number, it'll tell you what the Greek word is. So in verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Those first three words, let brotherly love, is one Greek word. You know what the Greek word is? Philadelphia. Philadelphia is supposed to be the city of brotherly love, isn't it? When they're not killing each other. But uh, that's the Greek word, the literally Greek word that is rendered, let brotherly love. Now, the word means brotherly love, but translators try to put it in sentence form where you understand it. So they put the word left in front of uh, brotherly love. And the word continue is the word mental. Not menu, but mental. And that means to remain, to abide, in reference to a place and so forth. Uh, I often use this phrase, it's your address. Don't be moved from there. So, this first verse, after telling us up here not to take advantage of grace and live badly because God's going to, is a consuming fire, so we need to live right. Now, in these three verses, the Greek, the author of Hebrews, starts zeroing in and says, here's some of how that living right looks. Christians must love Christians. Now, why? Again, I have them maybe on the... uh, Yeah, I got that toward the end, but I'm going to move it up. On the back side toward the bottom, John 13, 34, and 5. 
A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. So, why does he tell us not to abuse grace at the end of chapter 12, and then turn his attention to how Christians must love Christians at the beginning of chapter 13. Because Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus spent a long evening with his disciples. How long was it? John has, the Gospel of John has 21 chapters. Chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, and chapter 17 all took place in that upper room the night he was betrayed. Before they left and went to the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas kissed him to show the soldiers who he was. The night he was uh, betrayed. So I want you to get this. Over 20 percent of the gospel of John happens in that upper room. If there were only 20 chapters in John, it would be, counting chapters, not verses, obviously, it would be 25 percent of John took place in the upper room that night. So Jesus, they, they had communion, uh, it was the Passover land, our service that they were celebrating, but it, uh, the way they celebrated um, is the way we ought to partake of communion, remembering that Jesus was the Passover lamb. But it was the night of the Passover, and after the Passover meal is done, Jesus gets up and washes the feet of the disciples. Sometimes I think we just gloss over things and don't let it slap us upside the head. God washed the disciples' feet. Let me say that one more time. God, knowing that he was going to be crucified the next day, washed the disciples' feet. You would think if he knew he was going to be crucified the next day, he wouldn't care if their feet were dirty or not. But he was teaching them some things. This was, I can never stress it enough, and I don't know if people catch it when I say it. Hebrews said earlier to us, where there is a changing of the law, Hebrews is the better than epistle. And it teaches us that Christ is better than the angels. Christ is better than Moses. Christ is better than the high priest. Christ is better than this. Christ is better than that. Then he goes on to say the New Testament is better than the Old Testament. So the author of Hebrews is talking about how Jesus has become our high priest. There's a difficulty with that. He was not a descendant of Aaron. He was not even a Levite. You couldn't be any kind of a priest if you weren't a Levite, which means you were a descendant of the son of Jacob called Levi. Jesus was a descendant of Judah. Jacob's son, Judah. That's why you hear songs like the Lion of Judah. Jesus had no business being our high priest if we are living under the law of Moses. For Jesus to be a high priest, Hebrews goes on in chapter 7 and says, where there is a changing of the law, I mean, where there is a changing of the priesthood. So he's saying, we're going to go from Aaron 
to Jesus. Well, they, they had already done it when Hebrews was written. But the author is explaining this. For it to become legal for Jesus to become our high priest, where there is a changing of the priesthood, it necessitates, makes necessary, the changing of the law. Where in the gospel story do we see the law change? The night he was betrayed. When they were breaking bread, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then he went on to say, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Uh, We read it there on the back side of that. Because you have love one for another. So I want you to understand this. Jesus was asked once, what were the two great, uh, the, what was the greatest uh, law, of the uh, commandment of the law? They were expecting him to pick one of the ten. The ten were the most famous. But instead, he points out a verse in the Old Testament that says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and all thy spirit. Jesus said, that's the greatest law. And the second is likened unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Those under the law of Moses, were the, even though that neither one was in the ten, Jesus, who might know a thing or two, said they're the two greatest Old Testament commands. Now I want you to catch this. Jesus was not restating the second commandment here. He didn't say to his disciples, you should love one another like you love yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself was the second uh, Old Testament command. He didn't say, love your neighbor as yourself. He upped the bar. Some people don't like themselves very much. Some people like themselves way too much. But Jesus really raised the bar. He said, guys, I want you to love each other the way I love you. That was the changing of the law. No longer were the disciples to live under Moses. They are now to live under the covenant of Jesus. And because the law changed, boy, help. Starting with um, Exodus 20, all the way through Leviticus, or, or, you know, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Three and a half of those first five gruelingly long books, if you're going to read the Bible through. Three and a half of those are all about the law of Moses. There's some history in there too, but a lot of rules. A lot of rules. And Jesus just, when he changed the law, he really made it simple. He said, this is the new structure you're going to live under. Love each other the way I love you. Galatians 5, Paul seems to agree with that. He said, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith I have made you free. In verse 1. And then he goes on there, and he says a little later, only use not liberty as our freedom as an excuse. Uh, I forget the exact way he words that, but as an excuse to sin is what he's getting at. Don't say I'm free so I can do what I want. So if you take away Moses' rules, what is... The prohibition, I mean, the reason you didn't break the law of Moses, you get stoned to death. Now, Jesus removes that. They're removing a lot of laws in America today. They say, oh, just 900 bucks with a shoplift, he never hurt anybody. Jesus did it, but he changed the law, and his law only works for believers. 
So in Galatians 5, he said, Use not freedom as an... I'm trying to think of the word. Uh, it basically means as... It's a military term. As an op, uh, as the base of operations to sin. Don't say, Here I am here on liberty, therefore I can sin. He said, Now what's the restraint now? The law of Moses is gone. No stoning is mentioned. What's the new restraint? He said, But by love serve one another. So in Paul's writings, as well as in Hebrews, we understand that the new restraint is loving you the way Jesus loves me. And it's the only way the world will know we're the real deal, according to Jesus in the upper room. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. They might not believe what you believe, but they'll believe that you believe it. They'll believe you're the real deal, that you're not a phony. Jesus guaranteed it. If you love each other the way I love you, they'll call you whatever name they want to call you, but they'll know you're the real deal. You really believe it. And uh, there's no other way that we can convince. We can grit our teeth and quit smoking. We can quit drinking. We can quit cussing. We can quit going to shows. We can quit and we can quit and we can quit. And it won't impress anybody. But loving one another as He loves us is the new law. And so now that's what is being taught here in Hebrews 13. So after saying, let brotherly love continue, in verse 1 and verse 2 he said, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. I told him I, I regret my name, loving believer. I think I'm going to officially change it on the computer, um, angels unaware. Are entertaining angels on the way. And um, because he's going to put it up sometime, and I think I'd prefer that name. Uh, but he said, forget not to entertain strangers. Now he's talking about, you see up above there, he's talking about Christians. Christians loving Christians. And therefore he said, entertain Christians you don't even know. Uh, look at the Good News Bible rendering of that. Uh, remember to welcome strangers in your home. But the uh, translation called God's Word uh, said, Don't forget to show hosp t hospitality to believers you don't know. The idea is he's talking about Christian loving Christian here. Now, is it important for Christians to love unbelievers? Of course it is. But that doesn't do anything for anyone in the area of evangelism. Well, we, I mean, we need to love the unbeliever and share the gospel. Of course, that helps. But what I'm saying is, in this arena of them knowing we're genuine, they've got to be able to look inside and say, man, those people love each other. Those people really love each other. So he said, this doesn't only involve loving the people in your immediate fellowship. Boy, that's too bad because I'd just have to learn to love ten, ten people and we'd have a mate. Sometimes only eight. Uh, but that's not what he's talking about. Every believer on this planet is a spiritual relative of mine, a brother or sister in Christ. Every last one of them. So he said, even the ones you don't know, um, be, be sure to entertain them. It doesn't mean telling jokes, stand-up comedy or something. It doesn't mean sing them a song. It means welcome them into your house. And he goes on to say, thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Now, angels, uh, according to Thayer's Bible Greek Dictionary, means a messenger, an envoy, one who was sent, an angel, a messenger from God. So, what does it mean that I am to, you can put that over, to entertain angels? I mean, uh, I might entertain, when I entertain uh, Christians, I might be entertaining angels unaware. What does that mean? Now, I got some possibilities down there. You see the word possibilities. It could refer to actual angels from heaven. 
It could refer, refer to humans God has placed in our paths for our benefit or theirs. Remember, the word basically means a messenger from God. It doesn't have to be what we consider an angel to fit that description. It could be somebody that God has put in our path to bring some benefit to us or put in our path that we might bring some benefit to them. Uh, so it's possible it's not talking about angels as we think. Or it could refer to the fact that the believer who is our guest has angels attending him to him. Uh, Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. Um, I think every believer has angels watching over him. Every believer. So if I'm entertaining a Christian in my home, we had a... Uh, couple young Christians in our home um, two nights ago. Was it two nights ago? Saturday. Uh, was it Saturday? Oh, man, that's uh, three nights ago. Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Yeah, three nights ago. Um, and they were helping us with Sophie. Um, and young people, I mean, I think she was 19. Both were 19 her uh, man friend was 19 as well and uh, she is the daughter of the teacher that Barb works with in the school nice nice young Christian they were in our home which you never stop and think about because they're God's children they've got angels around them not only are our angels in that house when we're there but their angels were there. There's a whole lot of angels. So, he's saying, understand when you're entertaining fellow Christians that you don't even know, they're passing through town. Back in those days, everybody didn't have a car and a credit card uh, uh, to get a motel room. And when they traveled from town to town, travel was dangerous often and uh, wasn't, didn't, wasn't always a great place to stay. And Christians were being persecuted. So uh, they needed some other Christian in the area to reach out to them. And so he says, do that. And you never know what's going on in the spiritual realm when you're doing that. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The Old Testament is full of stories. And the New Testament, as it introduces the birth of Christ, the birth of John the Baptist to it, uh, we see a lot of angels running around in that story. Um, don't see a lot of other angels in the New Testament. Uh, we, we see them talked about sometimes, but not uh, uh, things going on with angels. But I'm going to tell you something. Everybody in, in Matthew and Luke in the Christmas story that's seen an angel, whether it was Zacharias, Elizabeth's husband, whether it was Mary, whether it was Joseph in a dream, whether it was a shepherd seeing a multitude of them, they were all afraid. Now, why should a Christian be afraid of an angel? I think it's just the natural fear that comes w with being swallowed up in holiness. Can you imagine being out in that cold field that night when the angels introduced to the shepherd that a Savior is born unto you this day? And the sky was full of angels and they were afraid I contend that if an angel walked in here right now and we all seen him I, I believe there are angels in here right now but if an angel and not only are there angels in here right now Jesus said where two or three are gathered together in my name I'm there in the midst of them the Holy Spirit is always here because he comes in with us he lives inside of us when Christians get together, we don't understand we are on holy ground. Not because we're special, but because God's messengers are around us. His Spirit is inside of us. It's one thing to know that and to talk about that. But if we would see an angel appear in the back of this room right now, Judging from everything I've read in the Bible about angels, I think we do a little gasping 
and we'd have to hear the same words that they usually speak to the people they appear to fear not and I believe that fear not would be a direct message from God and therefore a creative word and it would create calm in us so he's saying don't be afraid you know we're always afraid somebody's going to out to get us pretending to be a Christian trying to get something that we got and it's not always bad to understand there are a lot of phonies out there who want something from you not bad to understand that but sometimes we get so worried about that we don't realize some of this you get Christians together and amazing things can happen in the spirit realm even if we don't know they're happening I think Barb and I felt pretty good when the, those two 19-year-olds went home, you know. Hey, they, they were a breath of fresh air and uh, felt really good. So now he goes on with the idea of Christians. Love them, and then he, love them even if you don't know them yet. Uh, if they show up and, at uh, your door, let them in. And then in verse 3, he says, Remember them, and again, the idea... Uh, you see the contemporary English version underneath it. Remember the Lord's people who are in jail. So he said, remember them that are in bonds. So the subject is Christians. Love other Christians. Love them even if you don't know them, if they're strangers to you. Love them if they're in prison. I, Jay Sekulow had an email uh, sent to me that said there's, 16 or whatever doesn't sound like a big number but around the world there are 16 Christians being killed every day around the world so uh, just for their faith not because they did anything wrong but they're in some country where people don't like Christians and right now one of the places of course that he brought out is those who were left behind in Afghanistan hiding because of uh the Taliban finds them, they kill them. So they're trying to stay low and hope that the Taliban doesn't figure them out. Uh, so he says, remember them that are in bonds that bound with them. And this is, you know, this is a hard doctrine. Here's what it's saying. I should have real empathy with Christians who are struggling around the world. Not hear, read Jay Sekulow's email and say, Dungan, that's horrible. Honey, bring me a piece of pizza. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about real empathy. These are brothers and sisters of yours that have done no wrong to anybody. They're simply killed because of their faith. So he writes, remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. So, uh, the lesson tonight is simply about we got to love our fellow Christians, and if we don't, we're never going to communicate through our example what Jesus says we need to communicate to the lost. That that group of people love each other. They're the real deal. How many people in this world are just looking for someone to love them? And so, that's what chapter 13 starts us off on. Love your fellow believers.